Recently, I played Conker's Bad Fur Day for the first time. It was... disappointing. If you want to hear my full thoughts on the game, I'd recommend watching my video on it, but the gist of it is that it wasn't as good as I was expecting it to be. Don't get me wrong, it was funny, but that's sort of all it had going for it. I was hoping that amidst the sea of blood and feces and urine there would be an interesting game to play, but there wasn't. Which I found surprising because Conker's Bad Fur Day was made by Rare. I was under the impression that Rare was good at making games. They made Banjo-Kazooie and that game was amazing, so it really caught me off guard when Conker's Bad Fur Day was sort of not anywhere near the same level of quality. It's sort of like how it works with siblings. You have one sibling that is competent, likeable and going places, and you have the other sibling who wastes his life sitting in his room all day making YouTube videos about games. Ahem. <clears throat> you can understand where I'm coming from. Expecting something brilliant but receiving something underwhelming isn't a nice feeling. But my expectations weren't unfounded. Like I said, I've played Banjo-Kazooie, which was made by the same people. And that game was great. So it makes sense to expect Conker's Bad Fur Day to be just as good. Unless my memory has deceived me. It has been a while since I played Banjo-Kazooie. The last time I was in control of the Bear and Bird duo was in Smash Ultimate. And that was a while ago. Could it be that Banjo-Kazooie isn't actually as good as I remember? What if it actually isn't that good? That would explain why Conker was such a letdown. I need to figure out the truth. Today, I'm going to determine whether or not Banjo-Kazooie is as good as I thought. Now I have to admit, going into this game right after playing Conker's Bad Fur Day did not put me in the best frame of mind. I was expecting things I shouldn't have been expecting. I was expecting vulgarity, I was expecting animal abuse, I was expecting bodily fluids. Every time I saw an adorable googly-eyed character speak, I kept thinking, you know, there's a distinct lack of diarrhea in this conversation. It seemed unnatural. I had to keep reminding myself that this is Banjo-Kazooie. It's a different game, and it was strange having to readjust to a kid-friendly game. Rather than being coarse, Banjo-Kazooie is extremely charming in pretty much every way. The story feels like something straight out of a fairy tale. It goes like this. Gruntilda's a witch who speaks only in rhyme, and she plans to commit a horrible crime. Pretty and slim she desires to be, but she's ugly and fat, as we can see. How does she plan to obtain her beauty? By stealing it from a bear called Tootie. She mounts her broom and descends from her lair, kidnapping Tootie, it's so unfair. Now that he knows that his sister has vanished, Banjo sets out to see Gruntilda banished. With his bird friend Kazooie strapped on his back, Banjo responds to Grunty's attack. Through nine different worlds the pair must traverse so that Tootie is saved from a terrible curse. Jiggies and notes the two must haul so that Gruntilda is stopped once and for all. There's no more to say about this tale, because I can't think of any more rhymes. The short version of that is Gruntilda wants to use a machine to swap her looks with Tootie, making Gruntilda pretty and Tootie ugly, and Banjo and Kazooie have to stop her from doing that. A very simple and charming story. Charming is pretty much the perfect word actually, because it applies to the whole game. Everything about it is charming. The story, the environments, the music, it's all very enchanting. Every location is colourful and vibrant and bouncy, with memorable landmarks and layouts that make sense, which is something that Banjo-Kazooie's N64 platforming cousin Super Mario 64 didn't have. The music is all very memorable and upbeat, and I love that it's dynamic and changes based on your location within specific levels. It really helps to give each world more personality. It's all very catchy too, to the point where it's starting to get a bit irritating. I've been whistling the entire Banjo-Kazooie soundtrack since I played the game because I simply can't get the songs out of my head. I reckon if you cracked open my skull, ripped out my brain and smashed it to pieces, those songs would still be stuck in my head. I'm not asking anyone to try that. I don't want people to bash my brains out. It'll make such a mess and I don't want to inconvenience anyone by making them clean it up. But the point is, that's how catchy the soundtrack is. What I also love is that everything in the game is alive. Much like me, all the characters, including the enemies, are alive and speak with funny voices. But so are the inanimate objects, and even the collectibles are alive and speak with funny voices. I just find that so adorable and endearing, which is probably pretty immature for an adult. As an adult, I should be doing taxes and succumbing to alcoholism. But here I am being charmed by musical notes with googly eyes. Honestly, pathetic. But overall, the way Banjo-Kazooie is presented is brilliant and I love it. But the reason I was disappointed with Conker's Bad Fur Day had nothing to do with presentation or story. Banjo-Kazooie and Conker's Bad Fur Day had different goals in mind, 
and they both achieved them to a pretty high standard. Banjo-Kazooie wants to be light-hearted and happy, Conker's Bad Fur Day wants to gross you out and call you a fucking shithead. They're just going for different things. The thing that disappointed me with Conker was the gameplay which was not the best. I remember when I first played Banjo-Kazooie being very pleasantly surprised and satisfied with how much fun it was. But my memory is shocking at the best of times, and it does occasionally deceive me, so this is what this video is really about. How good is the gameplay in Banjo-Kazooie? Banjo-Kazooie is a 3D platformer. This shouldn't come as a shock to you, you've been looking at it for the entire video so far. More specifically, it's an open 3D collectathon in a similar vein to Super Mario 64 and Spyro the Dragon. Not so much like Conker's Bad Fur Day, which is more of a linear style. Maybe that's why Conker caught me so off guard. The goal is to explore a variety of worlds in search of jigsaw pieces, also called jiggies, as well as musical notes. These are required to progress through the game, and I'll go into more detail about them later. It's a very simple premise, and it's very clearly structured, and I like it. It's a formula that works. The vessel we inhabit to play this game is unique in that it isn't a single character, it's two. And I really like this, having the main protagonist be a two-in-one character is kind of a genius move. Not only does it allow for more interesting interactions with NPCs, but it's also a very creative way of increasing potential for moves and abilities. On his own, Banjo isn't really capable of much. He can run, jump, roll, climb, and do this pathetic swipe attack. Not a very impressive display. However, with the help of Kazooie in his backpack, Banjo can now also do a slam attack, a lunge attack, attack in the air, double jump, shoot eggs, shit eggs, run up steep slopes, turn temporarily invincible, pretty much anything you could possibly think of. There are also buttons scattered across levels that Kazooie can use to perform high jumps, and even fly as well as rubber boots she can wear to walk through dangerous liquids, and running shoes she can wear to go really fast. There's so much that this duo is capable of, to the point where it's kind of overwhelming. There was so much to learn and remember. I actually had to take notes to remind myself which combinations of Z and the C buttons did what. It felt like being back at school. Banjo and Kazooie are a very flexible and versatile pair of playable characters, and their moves can be applied in pretty much any imaginable scenario. Need to reach the top of a steep hill? The Talon Trap will get you there no problem. Stuck in a tunnel full of saw blades? The Wonder Wing will get you out totally unscathed. Having trouble with doubt and cripplingly low self-esteem? Well, I guess you could get Kazooie to bully you into believing in yourself? The point is, Banjo and Kazooie have plenty of techniques, each with various applications, that will help you collect everything there is to collect. Although, to be honest, the applications don't always make the most sense. For example, to get one of the Jiggies in Grunty's lair, you need access to a flight pad that is blocked by thick green spider web. To destroy the web, you need to shit eggs into it. And I don't know how you'd ever come up with that as a solution. If I saw a giant spider web blocking the way, my immediate thought would not be, gee, that sure is a giant spider web blocking the way. Shall we lob a few eggs at it? I wouldn't think that at all, I mean sure, no egg-based dish is complete without a bit of cobweb garnish, but I'm not cooking here, I'm trying to get past. No, my initial thought would be to get, like, a duster, and just sort of dust it away, you know, like any sane person would. I'd dust the web away, and put it in a jar ready for breakfast tomorrow. That aside, Banjo and Kazooie are comfortable to control, and their moveset is very diverse and well utilised. Now it's all well and good having an impressive set of abilities void of context. What really matters is how they come into play in the levels themselves. And I have to say, each level is built around Banjo's and Kazooie's abilities really well. I honestly think they're extremely well designed, they're open and give you room to explore, but they have distinctive landmarks and elements so you don't ever really get lost. And they're all very unique, both in terms of the way they look, and in the way they're laid out. Some levels are mostly flat and expansive, like Treasure Trove Cove, Others are really tall, like Click Clock Wood. Some are filled with water, like Clanker's Cavern. Others are very slippery, like Freeze Easy Peak. Each world offers something different, and that keeps the gameplay interesting. It's like eating from a box of Quality Street chocolates. They're all fantastic chocolates, but each one has a unique filling or flavour, so it never gets boring or repetitive. Sure, there might be one type of Quality Street you don't like, but that's perfectly fine, because someone else in your family loves that type of Quality Street, and they'll enjoy the shit out of it. And that applies to these levels too. There's a level in Banjo-Kazooie for everyone. I already mentioned that each level will have jump pads, flight pads, boots and shoes scattered about which add an extra layer to traversal, 
But there are also Mumbo's transformations. In some levels you'll come across Mumbo's hut, in which he'll transform you into a creature in exchange for silver skulls. Such wacky transformations include a termite, a crocodile, and a pumpkin. And I think these are actually done well. In most platformers, this sort of thing would be the type of gimmick I'd look down upon, simply because they distract from the gameplay that is actually good. But in this case, I'm actually alright with them. They're usually only required to collect a jiggy or two, or enter an area you aren't able to enter as regular Banjo and Kazooie. For example, Termite Banjo can climb on surfaces that even Kazooie's Talon Trot can't handle, allowing you to reach the top of the Termite Hill in Mumbo's Mountain. The transformations are used for simple things like that, and they're very temporary. They aren't forced upon you for an entire level. It's not like giving a red squirrel a shotgun, and forcing him to carry it around with him at all times, ruining everything. Isn't that right, Conker? I don't think any levels in Banjo-Kazooie are badly designed at all. They all have something different to offer, and none of them are boring. If I had to pick a worst level, I'd say Spiral Mountain, since it's just a tutorial level, and there isn't much happening. Even Gruntilda's lair, the hub world of the game, is interesting to explore, and it's very important that the levels of this world design because it makes the main aim of the game, collecting, that much more enjoyable. Speaking of, let's talk about collecting. There are two collectibles in Banjo-Kazooie, Jiggies and Music Notes, and both are required to reach 100% completion and actually beat the game. Each level has 10 Jiggies and 100 Music Notes. Jiggies are earned by completing certain objectives and are required to grant access to new levels. You might need to complete some kind of challenge, find something for an NPC, reach a particularly hard to reach area, pretty much anything, and they're all unique to the levels they're in. The only exception to that is that each level awards one Jiggy for finding all of the Jinjos, which are like these little rainbow elf things. There's a pretty strong variety of Jiggies across the game, some are pretty well hidden, some are very cryptic, and some can be pretty challenging, but I'd say they're pretty much all enjoyable, apart from one. Boggy's second sled race can go fuck itself. It is so unfair. I want to preface this by saying that it could be that I'm just shit at the game, and that's probably the likely reason, but I cannot believe how bullshit it was. From what I can tell, Boggy the Polar Bear is programmed to pretty much constantly match your pace. If you're in front of him, he drastically speeds up. If you're behind him, he drastically slows down. This means that if you try to do the race normally, he'll always speed up and overtake you at the very end, meaning you'll lose pretty much every time. I came so close to winning so many times, only for him to beat me by a bee's dick every time. The only way I could figure out to beat him was to intentionally slow down at the very end so he'd overtake me, then I could take the opportunity of his programmed slowed downness and overtake him back at the last second. And that is bullshit. Why not make it just a regular race? Why would you program it like that? That isn't fair, it isn't fun, it's not a test of skill, it's a test of mastering the art of bullshit. And the fact that I had to return to this level because I hadn't unlocked the running shoes yet made it even more infuriating. And you know what? I don't even care that the ice caps are melting. Polar bears will lose their habitat? Who gives a shit? If it means this prick Boggy, who's a cheating bastard and a deadbeat father dies, then I'm happy to burn enough coal for global warming to wipe him out for good. I don't actually want that to happen. I love polar bears, but Boggy in particular can go fuck himself. On top of Jiggies, you also need to collect notes. Each level has a hundred, and they're required to open certain doors in the hub world so you can actually reach new levels. They're scattered across each level, not exactly hidden, but there are a lot of them, so you will have to put in the work to seek them out and find them all. As this game's standard collectible, so to speak, I'd say they're on par with the gems from Spyro. They're very satisfying to collect, and I love the little jingle they play when you pick them up. But there's one thing about them I don't like. For some reason, the notes don't stay collected permanently. If you die at any point in a level, the notes are reset, and the amount of notes you collected before you die is your score and the game keeps track of your highest score in each level to determine how many you've officially collected and which doors in the hub world you can open. At first, I thought this was a bit strange. I mean, why not just treat them as collectibles? You only need to collect jiggies just the once, why can't it be the same with notes? Is it to make levels feel fuller if you revisit them? I can sort of understand that, but it's still a bit odd. But I didn't think anything of it until I got to Gobi's Valley. In Gobi's Valley, there's a challenge where you have to make your way through a labyrinth before time runs out. You're warned of a consequence if you fail, but not of what the consequence is. It turns out if you fail, you just die. You don't take damage, the game just kills you. 
dying completely resets the notes, meaning you have to go and collect them again, and this is really fucking tedious. And especially annoying seeing as going through the labyrinth the first time is essentially trial and error. It's a brutal punishment for pretty much no reason. I hate that. It's very rare for this game to insta-kill you. It happens here, and also if you fall in the engine room in Rusty Bucket Bay, but that's it. So it's not really that big of a deal, but it is noticeably irritating. Overall, the process of collecting notes and jiggies is fun and satisfying. This is one of those games where you can't help but go for 100%, and I think that's the sign of a well-designed collectathon, even if it is a bit unnecessarily frustrating at times. The game ends with a very surprising twist. I had forgotten about this part of the game and was excited to see it again. Normally when a game throws its traditional standard gameplay out the window, I end up hating it, but on this occasion I was thrilled. Rather than ending the game with normal platforming, Banjo-Kazooie ends the level with Grunty's Furnace Fun, which combines elements of board games, trivia questions and threats of death into a game show full of flavour. I've never really seen a game do something like this, and as someone who's basically reviewing the game, it really made me feel self-conscious about how well I was paying attention to what I was playing. I try not to skip details, and this final level really tested my knowledge and memory, and I really enjoyed it, but the real finale is the final battle, and the only boss battle in the game. And to my surprise, it was actually really good. A commenter on one of my videos pointed out to me that I find boss fights in games to be rubbish, no matter which game it is. And admittedly, that is true most of the time. But in this game, the final boss was excellent. It was action-packed, fast-paced, dynamic. It put everything you've learned on your journey to the test, and it was fantastic. It was a great end to the game. Of course, the one time I find the boss fights good is in the game that only has one boss fight. I wish there could have been more, but it's probably for the best. Quality over quantity, as they say. And speaking of quality, it's time to wrap up my thoughts. I think it's pretty clear to see that my memory did not deceive me. Not only was my memory correct, I think it undersold how great this game is. Banjo-Kazooie is one of the best platformers out there, I think. And I'm not just saying that, I genuinely believe that. It was very hard to fault, which I think is the sign of a quality game. It turns out that Rare is good at making games, they just shat the bed with Conker. And I suppose if any video game is going to shit the bed, it's only fitting for it to be Conker's Bad Fur Day. The gameplay in Banjo-Kazooie was phenomenal. It was satisfying, interesting, dynamic, and most importantly, it was fun. The way it was presented was utterly charming, it looked fantastic, it sounded fantastic, it was brilliant. Apart from a couple hiccups, Banjo-Kazooie was amazing, and was not just as good as I thought, but it was even better.